What is praise? Really take a moment and think about it. What is praise? Praise, the act of giving someone praise, is to lift them high for something that they have done. Like someone might praise a child for an incredible sports feat, or maybe you were praised for a work or some uh, hard work that you performed or something like that, I don't know. But in Psalms 105, which is where we're gonna be parking today, the psalmist encourages us to praise God. Now, I'm gonna be covering the second half of Psalms 105, but I'd like us to go back to the first couple of verses where this is really grounded. Look at what it says in the first two verses. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Now, if you read through Psalms 105, which I would very highly encourage you to do, there are some great accolades that the psalmist pushes upon the Lord. He praises God for the things that God has done and who he is. Now, where we're going to be looking at today, we're going to go ahead and jump all the way down to verse 31, if you'd like to follow along. It says, He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He gave them hail for rain and fiery lightning bolts through their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. Verse 34, he spoke and the locusts came, young locusts without number, which devoured all the vegetation of their land and ate up the fruit of their ground. He struck down all the firstborn in their land, the firstfruits of all their strength. If you're not too familiar with the Bible, you may not immediately recognize that actually what the psalmist is doing is referencing what happened in the book of Exodus. You see, if you even read the context, he talks about in verse 26 that God sent his servant Moses and Aaron, whom he had chosen. And he talks about the signs that they had performed in order to free the people from Egypt. But when you read through the book of Exodus, you see that it was no act of Moses. It was no act of Aaron that caused the people to be free, but rather it was God working through them. It was a beautiful pointing forward to the Messiah. And you might be thinking, Cameron, how is Exodus about the Messiah at all? Well, if you look through the book of Exodus, you see that the people of God were in bondage in Egypt. And they had cried out to God. And God promised that he would send a deliverer. He sends Moses. And actually, in this narrative, Moses is what we would call a type of Christ. Not that he is literally Christ, but he is a picture of what Christ would be and what Christ would do. And what you see happening is you have Moses. He goes into this land, not very boldly, I might add. But the God of the universe is behind his back. And he is using Moses like a microphone to speak powerful truths and to perform powerful miracles in order to persuade Pharaoh to let his people go. Now, God actually hardens Pharaoh, but that's a different conversation for a different time. And what you see happening and playing out is that as God is using Pharaoh's stubbornness to take down the false gods of Egypt, he's also establishing himself among the people of Egypt as the true and living God. But it was not just to glorify himself. No, no, no. And this is actually where the psalmist comes into play. As after he goes through all the different plagues, look what it says in verse 37. Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold, and there was none among the tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. You see, all these miracles, all these actions were with one central purpose, not only to glorify God, but also to free his people. And this is where it points forward to the Messiah. You see, the greatest miracle in the Bible was not even necessarily something that we could see as supernatural with our eyes, but those who witnessed this action, Jesus going upon the cross, they witnessed the most beautiful supernatural moment in the entire Bible in that specific moment when Jesus breathed his last, it wasn't necessarily as flashy as the sea dividing or as plagues falling upon Egypt, but it was even more powerful, if you will. Romans 5.8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we were in bondage to sin, to our, to our sinful nature, 
But when Jesus went to the cross, not only did he free us from that bondage, but he paid the debt we owed. What does that beautiful song in Christ alone say? It says, for on that cross when Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God and he freed us from the slavery to our sin. Now it goes on to say, he spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light by night. They asked and he brought quail and gave them bread from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock and water gushed out. And it goes on and on about all these blessings that God did after he was freed. This also is a pointing forward to the Messiah. In fact, if you look at Romans chapter 8 verse 32, listen to what it says. He, that's God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That verse is so powerful. Because you see, like how God did not just free Israel and say, okay, do whatever you want. He actually brought them into the wilderness, continued to provide for them. And long story short, he brought them eventually into the promised land. For you and for me, you have to know Jesus didn't free you for no purpose, but he freed you for the purpose of you continuing to follow him. And as you continue to follow him, he will faithfully provide for you. Now, he may not give you that Ferrari that you've got your eye on, or you may not always have as much money in the bank account as you would like, but it does mean God will always provide for you. He will always be there for you. He will always protect you. He will always be that loving father that you can run to. When you get that terrible news from the doctor, yes, you can run to your heavenly father. When you feel like there's not enough food on the table for everyone in your family, yes, you can go to your heavenly father. You see, the encouragement of Psalm 105 is that we have a God that was gracious enough to rescue us from terrible slavery. And he was also good enough to continue to provide for us. For you today, no, that as God did not spare his own son in saving you, he will also spare no expense in taking care of his children. And like how he brought the Israelites into the wilderness and eventually into the promised land, he will take care of you through this life and into the next.